Fellow footy travelers, welcome to the Footy Travelers Podcast, where those of us who travel specifically for soccer, or football if you prefer, come together to tell their best stories and share their expert advice. If you love the beautiful game, both on and off the pitch, and you like travel on top of it, you are in the right place. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travelers Podcast. Hey everybody, it's Colin here. Mike and I are back together in today's episode to talk all about our intercontinental summer tour, our 18-day North American and European adventure that had us at both the Copa America and Euro 2024 tournaments, attending a total of seven tournament matches, not before three pre-tournament friendlies, with five of those seven tournament matches between the two of us happening in five different cities on five consecutive days and, as you can probably guess, across two different continents. Passionate? We are. A bit crazy? Perhaps. Borderline psychotic? We are seeing someone about that. Labels aside, we're going to run down our itinerary, answer a listener FFT question, and leave you with some great footy travel tips from our whirlwind summer. Here we go. Mike, we are back on the mics together for the uh, first time since our last trip, which is, I guess, coming up on a few weeks now. It's been a minute since we've been on these mics together, although we've been on a few planes and in some stadiums together since then. Indeed. Also true. Uh, And I think we should talk about our time traveling together for both the Copa America and the Euro 2024 tournaments on what we were billing as the Footy Travelers Intercontinental Summer Tour. So what do you think about, uh, you know, maybe a quick little recap of the actual itinerary we had between June 22nd and our eventual final match on July 9th? Maybe it wasn't the final match of the two tournaments, but, you know, funny enough, we already have an episode out now about one of those games, one of those finals, that is, uh, or at least the chaos ahead of it. So real quick, listeners, be sure to check out our previous episode on the mayhem ahead of the Copa America final from the perspective of four incredible fellow footy travelers. But yeah, you know, speaking of incredible, Mike, shall we recap our incredible summer tour and I'll call it wild itinerary to kind of set the context of everything else that we're uh, we're going to talk about in today's discussion. Yeah, I think the itinerary sounds like a very logical place to start. Do you want to kick it off since you were the one representing us at our first official match of the tour back in June? Yeah, yeah, sure. I would, uh, I'd be happy to. So if we're talking, then summer tour stops for official tournament matches. We have to start with Houston, Texas, June 22nd for the Copa America match between Mexico and Jamaica at NRG Stadium. A 1-0 win for Mexico. Congrats, I guess. Uh, which actually, by the way, do you say energy or NRG when you mention that stadium? Uh, I mean, as a frequent Houston visitor uh, for the energy sector, uh, I've never heard anyone pronounce it energy. I mean, I say energy a lot, but they don't refer to the stadium in which you are referencing as energy, but rather they use the three letters very articulated NRG. No, no, no. I mean, I also say NRG. I just I've heard other people say energy and not being a Houston local or visitor, frequent visitor. Was it an accent? Maybe. Maybe Maybe, it was just an accent. maybe, Maybe a Brit said it or something. I don't know. All right. (laughs) We've clarified that. Um, Anyway, from there, Houston, NRG Stadium. The next day was June 23rd. I went off to Dallas, Texas for another Copa match, USA versus Bolivia at AT AT&T Stadium. That one, I believe, is pronounced Jerry World. Oh, touche. That was the first two stops. And then Mike... Monday, June 24th, as I was traveling from Texas to Germany, you actually were already there in Germany for our first Euro game. So, yeah. So Monday, June 24th, I pulled into Leipzig after a very late night in Frankfurt, partying with the Swiss. 
and then listening to the U.S. men's national team's match at 2 a.m. local time, which was also a fun little treat. This was our first in-stadium Euro match between Italy and Croatia that I was attending, which was a roller coaster of emotions as an Italian-American enjoying the late injury time heroics of Matteo Zaccagni to advance the Azzurri to the knockout rounds. But also as a lover of the sport and sadly witnessing most likely Luka Modric's Mm -hmm. last major tournament appearance, which was a bit of a bummer. Then comes the next morning, very few hours of sleep next morning, June 25th, when you land in Frankfurt and we both take trains to Dortmund to meet up for our first match together, which was France versus Poland at the infamous Signal Iduna Park, a.k.a. BVB Stadion Mm -hmm. during UEFA competitions, that is. Yeah, they changed the name. Yeah, because, you know, that's corporate. Corporate stuff. Uh, Or as the, I think, the more traditional folks will call it, Westfallen Stadion. Yeah. And at the train station stop, I believe that's what it's referred to. Also true. A a, a little bit of a travel nugget there, maybe, perhaps. (laughs) And so if neither of us had traveled hectically uh, already, the next day, on June 26th, we trained it again, this time together, down from Dortmund, to Stuttgart, where we met with the uh, the OG FFT, Scott Wiley. What up, Scotty? Uh, we caught ourselves the scoreless draw between Belgium and Ukraine at VFB Stuttgart's MHP Arena, a.k.a. Nakar Stadion. Uh, apparently, Belgium fans- That really improved. That really oh? improved from the last time we uh, we talked about uh, German stadiums and pronunciations. I think you- Pronunciation improved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, yeah. you spend a little time in Germany, you know, it rubs off. Maybe for you, not for me. No, we'll see later. We'll see later. Yeah, scoreless snoozer. Uh, apparently, the Belgium fans didn't like that result either uh, as they booed their team at the final whistle. Nor did Kevin De Bruyne like their response, it seems. No, yeah, that's right. He did not. Um, I think he wound up just marching the team away. Anyway, bit of a bad look on both sides, fan side, team side, in my opinion. But uh, we're still not done with our crazy summer tour. So next comes June 27th. After I had done three games in three days in three different cities, and together we had gone and done five games in five days in five different cities and two different continents, yeah, we finally took a beat. We took a little break. Finally. finally. We earned it, I'd say. We did. Yeah. We did. It was definitely time for a little pause at that point, Uh, although we obviously continue to enjoy some footy out of grounds on TVs. uh, We threw in some very welcome travel and tourism. So landing in Stuttgart, thanks to the graciousness and hospitality of Scott, previously mentioned, we were able to spend a couple days after our match day there just, you know, recovering, reloading, checking out sites like the Mercedes-Benz Museum, uh, catching up with other friends that we hadn't seen in years. Shout out to our homie Francis. Uh, And if we're AKAing stadiums, we'll AKA our homie Francis and say, uh, what up, fresh? But then we hit uh, Munich for a night to watch Germany's round of 16 game at one of the city's famed beer gardens. And to be fair, we also went to see Italy's game against Switzerland for our resident Azori Stan over here. That uh, I don't know if that was much of a game, but uh, um, mm. I will say in short summary, Munich was lovely. The beer gardens were lively and the German victory party was legendary. Yeah, yeah. And then from Munich, Mike, keep going with the itinerary here. So from Munich, we flew to the picturesque land of Portugal and its sun-drenched Algarve region to kick back, relax, and enjoy some summer coastal living. We have always talked about stopping in a country, still playing in knockout stages on our way home. Uh, Finally, we did it. We had talked about Spain or Portugal ahead of the trip. We ultimately, obviously, decided on Portugal. Thankfully, they advanced. And then it was time to return after Portugal stateside for some more Copa America. The madness is not over, folks. So from the Algarve, I headed north to Porto for some pastel de nata and some francesinha. Look it up. It's awesome. And port wine. Then eventually resting in the beautiful Azores. Uh, While Colin, you headed to Lisbon. And from there, we both returned stateside, but you went back just first. Yeah. Yeah. So having landed in Lisbon for the flight um, while you were still gallivanting across Portugal, uh, I flew with Kelsey. Uh, who had joined us as we all arrived in the Algarve, by the way. Uh, Shout out, Kelsey Bushk. We went straight from Portugal to Vegas on Friday, July 5th for what was supposed to be 
admittedly in a very optimistic uh, and eventually unrealistic scenario. The U.S. is hindsight. Yeah, we we know now. We know now how that turned out. Uh, But it was, in my mind, supposed to be the U.S.'s quarterfinal Copa match uh, on Saturday the 6th. Sadly, Mike, as you as you allude to with hindsight, it was not that match. Was that a spoiler alert? I'm Uh, sorry. I don't know. (laughs) Well, well, we all we all know already. (laughs) The tournament was spoiled, not by us. Yes. Um, Yes. That said, all that said, it was a fairly good game. Uh, It was Brazil versus Uruguay. We got to hang out and watch the Euros with some FFTs ahead of the Copa game. More shout outs. Uh, Shout out to Mark and Leela, a.k.a. U.S. soccer super fans, Eagle Man and Wonder Woman. Also, shout out to uh, to Don and Danny that we hung out with that day. Um, That game ended in a PK shootout, by the way, which happened at the goal we were sitting behind. And I don't know, my personal opinion, those are always fun to watch from that close up angle. So. I feel like we've had a lot of those. We've gotten of late. We've gotten lucky. Yeah. And, and especially in big yeah. tournaments, like deciding yeah. major outcomes. So, but yeah, anyway, after that, returning to the States, straight to Vegas, I finally returned home to Denver. And Mike, you made your way to the, uh, to the beautiful land. Speaking of picturesque places, New Jersey, New Jersey. Yes. Uh, by that point, you were in the home stretch. I flew from the Azores to beautiful JFK mm. Airport with the eventual goal to get to the beautiful birthplace of Taylor Ham, DJs, and the one and only Colin Patrick Martin. Oh, the man, so great. They had to give him three first names. <laughs> Never trust someone with more than one first name. <laughs> That's what I've heard. But three times. Oh, man. Anyway. I was touching back down stateside for the Copa America semifinal match at MetLife Stadium, host of the 2026 FIFA Men's World Cup final in a few years. But surprisingly, I was having an issue with my extra tickets not selling. Mm. You know, there was some guy named Messi playing, so I figured that wouldn't take long to sell. Flash cut to a montage of MLS match tickets selling for like a thousand percent face value for any Inter Miami games. But for some reason, I couldn't get any bites. I have no idea why. So. Given these moronic people that didn't want to see the goat play in the Garden State, I made the far-fetched suggestion that probably was already seated in your brain that maybe you should take one of my tickets. Knowing it was under 24 hours away for kickoff and across the country in which you just flew over days earlier, um, it was a bit far-fetched. But like the lunatic that he is, folks, he said, hold my beer and hold that ticket. And he booked a flight to join me and some great friends and about 80,000 Argentinian fans for that match. A lot of, lot of Argentinian fans. Well, notice I didn't say Argentines because trust me, there were your Messi, La Albi Celeste fans that did not hail from Argentina, which is fine. But just wanted to call that out that, that there happens. was a lot of Messi Argentina fans. Every, but that's, everywhere we go. You know, when you're the goat, you, you bring the fans. So there but, it was. But there it was. That was the uh, the perfect storybook ending of a wild whirlwind summer tour for the footy travelers meeting up again in a fleet of a fleet of fancy spontaneity, spontaneity. Yeah, fleet just of fancy. Uh, yeah. you know craziness. Yeah, our our, <laughs> our crazy itinerary over the course of gosh two and a half weeks, I'd say together doing seven games. And and actually, we we didn't really even mention at the beginning the three pre tournament friendlies we attended. By the way, you right. know, I'll just add that real quick there too. Uh, but seven tournament games across two continents in, in 18 days. Wow. I mean, God, I, I mean, I don't need to like get a resume up here. Yeah. But, you, know. uh, yeah. you don't want to sound too cocky or prideful. I get it. I get it. But you know, that huh? it's resume worthy. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive. You know, some would call it impressive. Others like my family, friends and coworkers might call it psychopathic, <laughs> uh, especially your last minute, less than 24 hour audible trip. But hey, that's footy travelers traveling, that, baby. That, that is footy travelers. That's footy traveling. That's what we do. As any passionate, crazy or borderline psychotic footy traveler knows, with the end of summer coming soon, it will no doubt bring with it the beginning of the next Premier League season, which this year kicks off on Friday, August 16th. If you're still looking for a fantasy Premier League to test your armchair tactical prowess, and you like the idea of three chances to win big throughout the upcoming season, email bestdamnfpl at gmail.com to get more information on the Game of Thrones League. But hurry, 
Registrations will close on Thursday, August 15th, so there isn't much time to act. If you need any extra convincing, Mike and I have enjoyed participating in this particular league for several seasons now, and there will be some footy travelers gear up for grabs for the winners, on top of some significant cash prizes. There's more info in the show notes. All right, back to the episode. So what were your personal highlights of this whole thing, this whole crazy itinerary? What would you say people have to know about? Yeah, this question I love and I feel like I get it the most when telling people that we cumulatively went to six matches or excuse me, 10 matches um, over, you know, a, a, a significantly short duration. But the question's always like, okay, what's the match highlight? So I got to put one match highlight in here and it's got to be arguably one of the most exciting group stage matches that happened this year in the the Euro specifically, maybe even between the Euro and Copa. Um, Italy versus Croatia live in person in Leipzig, sitting around a bunch of Croatian fans in an Italian jersey, definitely not anticipating the result of that match going the way it did. It was wild. Leipzig was beautiful and covered in Croatians. And I remember walking through the streets thinking to myself, this is why we came to the Euro, because it's so much easier for these European countries and their fans to travel. So they come in swarms. And I think that was a very, very cool experience to just be around those Croatians. Unfortunately, they were not very happy after the uh, match, though. I mean, you know, can't can end well for everyone all the time. Right. But I will say the counter argument to that, not argument, but the I got the to taste the 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 glory of victory, or I guess what would be classified as a victory for some in the Swiss fans uh, when I was in Frankfurt. They were playing Germany in the in the uh, group stages and they drew that match. They should have won it, but they drew that match and they classified that as a very big victory. And they got after it full blown, lots of drinking, wanted everyone a part of it. And so that was a that was a highlight for me because I was like probably no more than like 10 hours after I just landed off of a red eye and went and watched that match in a bar near the fan zone and it just like turned into it devolved into quite a late night. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Highlights, low light inside the bar, maybe late at night. Right. Yeah. And needing low light uh, you know, the next day yeah, for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. Some strained eyes. What else? I mean, seeing our our buddy, our OG Scott, and not only seeing him at another tournament, but having him host us and get some quality time with him definitely was a highlight for me you know that marks our fifth uh major football tournament that we've seen him at i want to say so yeah four world cups yeah. and a euro yeah yeah he's the only guy i've ever uh aside from you oh i was like whoa wait whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> where's this going <laughs> aside from you the only dude that uh or only person um that i've been to all six continents inhabitable continents that i've like been in with You've been to Australia? No, I not no, not Australia with him. Never mind. Mm, yeah, see, see, <laughs> that would have been that would have yeah. been a really fun, that would have really been a fun little prank on you. Like, actually, we just scooted over to Australia wow. real quick just to check it off the list. Absurd. Sorry, didn't mean that. Five. Comments. So I still hold the title. That's what you're saying. You do. You okay. still have I'm, the belt. I'm still your one and only. Yes, always and forever. <laughs> uh, the love is real here, folks. The love is real. I do think a highlight that you and I had together because I well, obviously with Scott, but. When we were in Dortmund, that was our first day reconnecting in Europe together um, of our trip. And I think we had a pretty fun time at the BBB Dortmund Stadium. Yeah, Signally Duna. Um, yeah. That was, you know, hanging around the yellow wall after the match and like just throwing footy traveler stickers on every part of that stadium. I mean, that was a pretty fun time. I cannot wait until the uh, like the FFT photos come in through some DMs or what have you with like, oh my gosh, I went to Dortmund and I found your sticker. I mean, they were right. It will be hard to find. So yes, if you're up for a challenge, wise. go find go find <laughs> them. But they're 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 in a lot of good spots. I can't wait actually to put out a little. Uh, I have a little Instagram reel idea. We'll uh, we'll be putting forward as the um, the season for Bundesliga gets closer, but. Keep your eyes peeled. Mm, yeah. Nice teaser. little teaser. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, that stadium, very much a club stadium. And that club very much, you know, obviously has its own personality. Real, real grungy and just like almost like punk rock. 
I, 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 I loved gritty. it. It was dirty. It was gritty. Yeah. Yeah. It was very much a classic stadium that really only inspired me more to just want to go visit for a Dortmund match, right. honestly. Do it proper. Yeah. Any other highlights travel wise I mean, or other than footy or I don't yeah. know? Footy on vacation, you know, the, us taking a little little break, but still watching some footy while in Portugal was, I mean, we've we've been talking about it for a long time and I'm glad we finally did it. And, you know, there's nothing like sitting seaside, having some drinks and watching football. It's just, there's it's pretty, pretty fantastic. It's like the coming together of all the best things in the world. <laughs> right. It's amazing. Jeez. So yeah, that was a that was a big highlight. I will say, I mean, Germany was a whirlwind, and so I will say it was a tale of two types of trips. Like yeah. Germany was quick and fast and we just always had something going on each day. And Portugal was much chiller. Yeah, and I mean I would argue as it should have been, given the actual physical environment we were in in Portugal. Right. Well, what about you? Highlights. Highlights. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, I'll break it down. I'll do some footy, you know, centric highlights. I think I have some travel highlights and then I have, it really is a combination of footy and travel particular moment, particular evening uh, that really stood out for me, but footy wise, sport wise, generally the highlight was seeing the difference, the tangible difference between the vibe of the euros and, you know, the vibes of the Copa. There were all these, you know, cliches about the differences between the two tournaments on the field, like across the internet as we were traveling and and the tournaments got started. They were, I thought they were accurate. (laughs) The more I watched both. There was like dance. What were there? Like there were some dance. Romantic uh, dance versus knife fights, you know, like. Right. (laughs) what, What flavor do you want? Pick your tournament. Yeah. But the vibes and everything like off the field, outside for the fans, just the general overall environments, uh, you know, they were, they were different and I could, I could feel that. And maybe that was the organization of them and the difference between the organizing bodies. Maybe everything just kind of seemed smoother. Well, I mean, not, not, not kind of like everything did seem smoother at the Euros, you know, each, each town, each stop we went to and granted they were smaller cities and smaller towns. So maybe it's easier to do so, but like they fully embraced the event. You know, they had places to gather, places to drink. That was also my first time in Germany. So maybe that's just Germany in general. But, you know, I compare that to a place like, you know, going back to Vegas, there's just so much else to do as well, like in addition to a a soccer event that's happening, even though it it is happening in that place. So it's kind of, it's hard to feel fully immersed in the footy in the States at the Copa. Because again, well, all those things. And I think, and tell me if you agree with this, but it's also, you have to think about Copa, like didn't get promoted until like two months before right, 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 the right. event kicked off. Whereas like Euros was getting promoted, like Scott two was years. sending us pictures of them. Yeah. It, like it's been, it's been hyped up for so long. So obviously people are going to take note of it. And, but I think you're right too. Like you are coming from smaller towns versus big cities that have a lot of other things going on in the States. Right. So I guess, you know, kind of just to like to come full circle, I think the highlight when it came to the footy for me was being in a place, being in an environment that fully understands what it's like to embrace that footy fan culture. Um, And maybe even, you know, maybe this is fair to say a place that has been influential in defining the more romanticized version of footy fan culture. I mean, there's different, different types of fan cultures. I get it. But, you know, it was uh, for me, highlight just just being there and feeling like I belonged in a way. So, I mean, this may be a section for later in a discussion, but I learned a lot about German football and the fandom, like being around Germans talking about what they care about and why they're different than a lot of other European countries or any countries really. Um, Okay. So you had a football, you had a football category, right? You had a travel category. Yeah. Highlight travel wise, you know, not to borrow too much from you, but like the Algarve, holy crap. It's got, it's got to be the time there. And maybe not just being in the Algarve, but for me specifically, it was being in and on the water. We were, we went and did that boat day. That was fantastic. Um, we had that afternoon. It was a large boat. It was, yeah. Well, like 50 some plus feet, right? I think. Yeah. Um, we, we bouged it we, up. We, yeah. We, we classed it up. We all, I mean, we went in on it with some friends and whatnot. So that helped. But yeah. Did the afternoon kayaking around the, uh, the Benagil Caves. That was a, a happy place for me, I would say. It was legitimately crowded. 
I have to admit. And typically that would be like too crowded for my liking, but I didn't care. Being again on the water, just at the sea, in the ocean, I, I enjoyed it nonetheless. When you say it, do you mean like the Benagio Caves specifically or like all of uh, Portugal, like water that we were around? Good, f- fair question. The Benagio Caves and like the area on the water, like up on the coast, like right near them, which just filled with boats and kayaks and just like, you could tell that it is a newer touristy place and they have yet to like really regulate it. So that that specific area. Like Thailandy, which I liked. Yeah. Th- Thailandy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Which isn't a word, but it, it is it now. Those no, it is now. Yeah. We've made it a word. <laughs> uh, in the Footy Traveler Dictionary of Words that you will not find in Webster's, <laughs> look up Thailandy. And then, yeah, last highlight, I think I'll say, yeah, this will probably come as no surprise to you, having been there with me. But our call to do a beer garden specifically in Munich during our last night in Germany for the round of 16 matches, uh, and especially the Germany round of 16 match, you know, to me, that was the perfect combo of everything I think we're about. You know, we immersed ourselves in this little slice of local culture, but to be fair, we did it via soccer, you know, via the football. But again, to go back to the footy highlight, just the crowd there, the vibe, the physical setup itself was something I think all cities in the U.S., regardless of whether or not they're hosting a match, but all cities in the U.S. need to have something like a German beer garden for the World Cup 2026. Which I think they do in some places. I just don't think it's like become a very standard thing but there are some places that are like touting themselves as beer gardens and they have the benches and big screens and stuff. sure 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 but it, they need to like promote themselves and host watch parties for right. world cup 2026 yes. and every single day especially during the group stage <laughs> you know yes. let's get into it people anyway they, yeah, you know they had a like, dj there there was german house music in between you know halves and in between games and th- we might have to put one of those songs just spliced it in there a little Johnny Depp. <laughs> we'll do that. Hey, you guys want to hear a German house song? Johnny Depp. Dem, 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 Johnny Depp, Depp. Um, yeah, the content we put up on Instagram of me dancing like an absolute maniac. Uh, if you missed that, you can still catch it on the account, on the profile at Footy Travelers. But yeah, that um, that sums it up perfectly for me, those images. So speaking of beer gardens and all these things we experienced, how about we get into our last segment here? We talk a little bit about some tangible takeaways. So uh, one of them would be regarding the beer garden. uh, When in Germany during a German match, you might want to make a reservation at a beer garden because it's super tough to get into one. We were fortunate enough to, you know, I'll talk about grace them with our little smile. I'll talk about. Yeah. 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 Let's 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 dive into some lessons learned. So I'd say we learned a few things along the way. We're always learning new things. Uh, One of the beauties of travel, I think. So I want to share some of our lessons learned, uh, or some people, for some completely unexplainable reason, all of a sudden started calling them learnings, as if we already didn't have the word lessons. Where the hell did that come from, by the way? Wow. Okay. You okay? Where where, 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 uh, where did we get that word? Learnings. I, I just... It feels like they struck a nerve. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm. I'm fine. I, I'm fine. I just. No. I mean. I, I just can, really I can tell you're fine. I just really hate that word. Bro- learnings. You brought up our lessons learned, though. Maybe we should just get back to that. I mean, now I just want to find a way to <laughs> drop in the word learnings in the conversation, just to really set you off. Yeah, don't do it. But um, I mean, maybe it would help if we just called them like travel tips. Yeah. We and we have referred to them as such before. So, much better way to frame it. Um, I have a few travel tips <laughs> I think are worth sharing. Uh, I want to hear yours as well, but I want to explore a specific one around a question that one of our listeners and fellow footy travelers asked ahead of our trip. Hey, this is Robbie from Denver, and uh, I wish I was going to Germany. And what I'd like to know about Germany is, as you go from town to town, what the different beer cultures are, what, uh, what's a good beer in one town, What's, what do beers cost in the stadium? Where they uh, where they cost in town square? And uh, just favorite towns and which beers were your favorite in each town? Ooh, that's a great question, Robbie. I'll I'll start here, and I will admit that I'm not typically a big beer drinker. But when in Rome or Germania, in this case, I did have plenty at the Euros. 
that said, Colin, why don't mm-hmm. you take this one? Okay. And I'll come back with some tips and lessons, not learnings, that I learned this time around as well, since I'm just not the beer guy. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate that emphasis, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So um, I'd say Robbie's on point in his understanding that different regions of Germany specialize in certain brews of beer. Despite my greater propensity to opt for beer when I do drink, I won't, caveat here, I won't claim to be an expert on German beer, but I think it is fair to say that the most popular or most widely popular beer in Germany is probably the Pilsner, um, but especially in the North, the West, and the East, uh, so I've read at least. Um, And then you get into the South, Bavaria area, you know, Munich, as we saw, I feel like it was all Helles Lager or Weiss beer or Dunkel. I think you had some Dunkel at the beer garden. So one of my favorites, one of my personal favorites recently, at least, is a you know a good Kolsch, which comes from the Cologne or Cologne area. Uh, and then you have you know an area you were in, Mike. You know if you're in a place like Leipzig, I'm curious to hear whether you noticed this while you were there or not. I know again it was a short time, and you're not a huge beer drinker. But apparently, Gosch is a good beer or Gosch to get in and around you know that city of Leipzig. I think it originated in Goslar, which is only maybe two hours northwest of of Leipzig. So yeah, anyone heading to Germany, as Robbie alludes to, just ask which beers are local to that particular region you're in. I'd say try as many as you can. Mike, what do you notice or what did you notice? Can you speak to the second part of Robbie's question? You know, what what did you notice about beer in different places or um, I should say the difference, if any, in prices? between beers in a place like a stadium and then beers like in town. Yeah. So the beers at the stadium were reasonably priced, like yeah. seven euros for 500 milliliters. And outside the stadium, they were pretty much the same price. They they really didn't vary that much. And I feel like I I had seen a variety of different you know establishments, right? If you're going to a, a super nice place that may be costing a little bit more or if you're paying for a, a larger you know volume or whatever. But I think ultimately... They were not like crazy what we anticipate like American prices or American stadiums to do when they kind of jack prices up. So that's that that I think was really welcoming. <laughs> you know, you could you could go in and have a couple beers and a snack and it would it was like pretty reasonably priced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ironically, as you were talking about Leipzig, actually, my first drink that I had when I was in uh, that region, that part of Frankfurt and Leipzig uh, was a apple v- uh, apple vine. Or uh, it's like a, it's essentially a like cider? a cider. Okay. Yeah. So it's apple based. Um, so for those that don't really care for your traditional beers, the Bavaria area does have sort of like different types of ciders and stuff um, that were pretty good, pretty strong. Bavaria, um, like in the South? Oh, wait, I said Bavaria, but I was, I meant, I think it is in the South. Now, now I have to do my own research here. Look up um, the cider. It's Germany. They the got cider. great cider. Apple vine. I believe is what it was. It looked like apple wine on the menu. And so I was like, that sounds fun. Okay. But then if you are going to drink beers, know that there are steins that are available typically at the beer gardens, which does just generally feel pretty fun to just be like lugging a huge stein around and like cheers in with your mates. But as you know, chemistry goes and you're outside and drinking a cold beer out of like, I don't even know how many liters those things are. Um, Should be. They get warm. Single, a sing, a Stein would be a single liter, right? I think so. Well, I mean, I think some of the crazy beer gardens will do like super big ones too, but I don't know. I can't drink beer that fast, so they get warm. And if you don't like warm beer, uh, yeah, maybe maybe do the Portuguese style, which is like get a bunch of just small glasses and just keep drinking beers and get up and get them that way. So Chem- chemistry, um, thermodynamics coming together to warm your beer up pretty quickly in a Stein. Just just beware. <laughs> well, buyer beware. Right. As we know, a buyer maybe be delighted. I think maybe I don't know if we talked about this price point specifically yet. I remember the Steins at the Munich Beer Garden to give you know this comparison to uh, American stadiums, as you mentioned, Mike. The Steins there were like ten fifty euros, and that and, and again those are like a, a liter, a lot of beer. You get like I don't know a half liter, maybe a, a third liter beer at an American stadium, and it's like what fifteen dollars minimum, maybe so. Minimum, yeah. yeah. Price point comparison. There you go. But and um, they're a bit heavier on the alcohol content, which, typically as which well. Ones? So Germans, German yeah, beers. Okay, fair. Yeah, yeah. At least Dunkels are. 
Mike can attest. <laughs> well, Robbie, hopefully uh, that's what you're looking for as far as uh, you know information around that question. Um, for any listener, you know, never hesitate to reach out, by the way, and ask us a question. We'd be happy to feature it here on the podcast. You can either email us at uh, footytravelers at gmail.com. One L in travelers, by the way. Uh, or just DM us on Instagram or X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle is at footy travelers, also still one L. But Mike, what about your, uh, your other takeaways, tips and lessons, uh, you know, beyond the beer question? I have, uh, I have so, mine I'll get to, but yeah. I think we've, we've talked about this before, but fan zones are a very popular place for people to go watch matches, whether they are the host country or other. Um, we experienced this when we were in Germany. They were very popular for places that, for people to watch, especially I think just the locals like to go there because it is a bit of a more of the um, spectacle. So if you don't have a match ticket, people will want to go there and watch. So my recommendation there is to get there early if you want to. I experience not being able to get into one. That was one thing that I thought was really great about Germany. They weren't allowing just people to just roll in and create an overcrowded situation. They were stopping people from entering once it reached capacity. You, you mean so, they just didn't let people rush in and then realize they were over capacity? Isn't that crazy how they do that? Wow. It's like they were thinking wow. about people yeah. and their safety. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, crazy. Go crazy, yeah. Um, and then I would say there is still a community of cash, uh, you know, exchange, you know, people, people, businesses are still taking cash and a lot of times they are not taking card. Like a I cash economy. Noticed it. Yeah. I mean, it was not like heavily, I mean, you could pretty much get anything with a card, but there were some instances on my first few days where if you're going through plazas or you're going through areas that are maybe a little bit more busy because of the event that they don't want to take card or they do not accept card. And so I kind of got stuck and had to go to the ATM pretty quickly, which I was surprised by, given that most people assume Europe is very much card friendly. Yeah, as did I, as did I. And I'm glad you actually mentioned it to me before I arrived in Europe. I did take out some cash and exchange it. Um, I have a quick little like almost horror story. And I'm so, I was so lucky I was with Kelsey and we had two debit cards. And I, I'm alluding to the end already, but like, if I may. Yeah, go. So do it. definitely have cash and get it early. Like don't get it at the end of your trip when you're in a rush to get to the airport because the the context is that we had parked overnight with our rental car in a parking garage. We woke up the next morning to take the car to the airport and return it. And you know the people at the hotel told us, oh, you'll be fine paying with a card. And the, the machine at the parking garage was set up to take cards. But of course, on that particular morning, it wasn't working. So we needed cash. I had cash. But I had a 50 and it only took 10s and 20s. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I needed to go then to the ATM across the way. And I didn't specify what bills I wanted. And so it gave me a 50 because I asked for 50 to cover like a $20, $25, sorry, 25 euro, you know, parking ticket. And I'm like, oh, shit. Well, let me do another transaction and ask for like 10s and 20s this time. Well, because I had done back-to-back -back inserts of my bank card, my bank froze my flag. Yeah, it. flagged it, so I couldn't get I couldn't get different bills. So I had to run back into the parking garage, go ask Kelsey for her ATM card, and this time actually ask for tens and twenties. We paid it and we went. But again, just to come back to the idea of bring cash, have it ready, have small bills, and just have it early in your trip so that you can go throughout your whole trip without any stress of trying to get cash late. It still matters. People still accept cash. Other lessons learned. Or, 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 you know, tips, travel tips. You know, in Germany specifically, I think we both experienced the highs and lows of train travel. An, an itinerary such as ours would probably have been impossible in many other countries, given that we were going to many different cities very quickly and had pretty tight timetables, if we're going to be honest. And we were able to do it with the German train system, the Deutsche Bahn. Deutsche Bahn, yeah. And the irony is, is that I found them to be pretty consistent. They were some were a little late here and there, but the quality of the trains were really good and the 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 numbering and the car numbers and like they were did announcements and the boards, everything about the train travel and I did a lot of train travel as did you was pretty freaking smooth by comparison to say at least my experience in the United States on Amtrak train travel. Yeah. Now, Germans have a much higher standard 
and talking to Germans, they couldn't like they could barely even give any positive note about the train travel. They're like, they're always late They're There's always things stuck on the tracks. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I mean, even yes, I had like one, I was stuck on a track for like maybe 30 minutes, but like, I don't know. I, I just, I didn't find it to be so awful to the standard that the Germans were sort of yeah. implying. Yeah. And so I don't know if you felt the same. I, I did. I thought the trains were fine. Uh, I thought they were pretty, pretty excellent. You know, my, I, I, I think I can empathize that the, the, the late, the, how do I say this? The number of minutes, the amount of time that they were late in some instances was ridiculous. And I actually have a story about this, if I may, uh, in a quick second, but yeah, from all, all intents and purposes, the, the train travel was fine and it was great and it was efficient and generally on time. I'm sure that was like two or two to five minutes late sometimes, but like, you know, it's two to five minutes. That said, um, let, I'm just going to interject with one travel tip, piece of advice, I'd say. The headline is advocate for yourself. There's going to be times when you're traveling where you just like, you need to step up and tell someone like what you either want or need because you're not going to be offered it otherwise. So speaking of trains, I landed in Frankfurt and my plan was to just at the airport, hop on that train to Dortmund to meet you. And you, the thing was you had to book a specific train and a specific departure time, which we, you know, we did ahead of time. And I chose a departure time that was like two hours after my arrival. I wanted to give myself some cushion to get through customs and all that stuff. And um, I didn't check a bag, which, you know, I usually don't anyway, but I wound up like having two hours, right? I was ready to go two hours before my train was scheduled to leave. And at that- Because you touched down like earlier than your anticipated time as that, well, right? I think that was like, also part of it. Yeah. Like I may have landed a whole half hour early or something, you know? So I had a lot of time. And at that point, the train that was running the same route I was going to do in two hours, uh, a train I could have selected when I booked my ticket, uh, that had yet to leave. So I'm like, oh, well, why don't I just hop on this train? Like I actually did make that time. I could get on this train. So I asked, you know, can I get on this train? I have, I've paid for a ticket. Here's the proof. And they're like, no, nine, you have to get on the train you booked. You know, <laughs> you couldn't possibly get on another train. I was like, ah, all right. Actually, I, and I shouldn't maybe describe it that way because the first guy was a little more kind and, and pleasant. He did say that if my train was delayed by a certain amount of time, then it would be okay for me to jump on another train. But it wasn't. It was at that point on time. So I'm like, eh, all right, well, maybe I'll just go ask somebody else. So I went down to the platform and the earlier train showed up and I went to like get on the car I was supposed to be on with my ticket for the later train. And then this woman came off like working the train and she was t checking tickets. So I, you know, I asked her again and she said, no, you have to get on the other train. And that train takes away or takes off. So after it takes off, like moments later on the board, you can see that my train is now delayed by like over 30 minutes, maybe close to 50 minutes. So I should have been able to get on that train. But like the issue, the issue was I asked. I didn't just like take it upon myself. And eventually I wound up just getting on the next train coming through anyway, taking it to Dusseldorf, uh, switching trains there and going to Dortmund. Met a, a really cool um, fellow traveler that we talked and, and connected and we, we both decided to do the same thing. He was also heading to Dortmund from the airport. So um, yeah, just, just advocate for yourself. I had to do it actually another time, not advocate for myself, but like come overcome a, a little travel hiccup with transportation in Houston, between Houston and Dallas. But maybe I'll defer to you real quick before I, I jump into that story. No, I mean, I, I think you're spot on. There were several instances in my trip that I had to do that for various reasons, whether it's, you know, wanting to just maybe not take no for an initial answer and finding potentially an alternative. Which is what we did at the beer garden. No, right, that was the right. one point where I wanted to come back and say like, yeah, they told us no, we didn't have a reservation. And then I was like, well, let's go ask again. Let's just ask a slightly different question. Say, hey, what do, I don't know, I forget what I said, but you know, is it possible that we can go, come in now and then if someone come or, or if someone cancels, can we, that's what the question was. Is it possible that someone doesn't show up and then we can take the reservation? And then the guy was like, all right, well, these guys really want to come in. Uh, they're being you know, polite about it. They're just asking. And he actually offered an alternative, which was if you go stand up on the balcony and don't stand it and take up space at a table, you're welcome to just come in and watch. So, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think I think that's a 
it's a good lesson for everyone just in terms of whether it be traveling or not. But I think oftentimes traveling, we can be a bit skittish in the idea that like, okay, you get told no, I don't want to be a disruptor. I don't want to cause a scene. I don't want to break rules because I don't, you know, fortunately it's Europe. You don't anticipate punishment to be, you know, extremely harsh. Whereas, you know, maybe don't take this advice in certain countries that this could be a bit more disruptive, but yeah, advocate for yourself try an alternative method of, you know, finding a way to make a situation work in your favor, not taking advantage. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say. Okay. Well, let me, let me jump in then with my, my, my second little transportation hiccup story. You may have seen it on Instagram as well, but we had booked a pre-booked a bus between Houston and Dallas and we were leaving the morning. And I say, we, this is me and Don Armando. Shout out Don. We're leaving Houston. The morning of the game in Dallas. Flixbus, death to Flixbus. You're dead to me. <laughs> they cancel our bus 45 minutes before departure time. And so we're kind of screwed. This also maybe is a lesson in like conserving and saving up on some miles, airline miles, some, some travel points here and there. Because what we did was just like, all right, I looked at flights right away between Houston and Dallas, and I could book us two flights on, on United points. And so we booked the flights through points. We made sure that we could actually get to the airport in time to get there. And, uh, you know, I would hate to book a flight and then miss it because <laughs> like, we we're in such a rush. But we booked the flight and then we booked the Uber and then we went to the airport and we just flew to Dallas. And we actually, I think we landed around the same time we would have bus arrived. So, yeah, it was just, you know, cause some, it took some quick thinking on your feet. and but But having those resources of the miles and not taking the hit to your wallet financially um, was helpful. So maybe the other, beyond advocating for yourself in, in certain instances, not taking no for an answer, be ready with you know some backup plans or backup resources when it comes to transportation and travel. So I have a kind of a random tip, travel tip. Yeah. Go um, not to non sequitur this, but you know, on the credit card machines, obviously I think we, we're operating a system where it, you, most credit cards just offer they, they don't charge conversion fees. So it, it makes sense to just select the local currency to be charged onto your card on that machine. Because typically, just for people, just for visual sake, typically when you put your card in and it's based in a country that has a different currency, it will then prompt to say, do you want to select which currency you want this charge to be based from? Yeah. Whether it be in dollars if you're in the United States or euros and if you're in right. Europe. And we were in Europe. So it was like, do you want euros or dollars? Because I recognized that they were American credit cards. But you select select the local currency just always because your bank's going to convert it. And, and hopefully you have a good credit card where they're not charging you that conversion fee or you have a travel rewards card or something like that. But there was this weird little sneaky second attempt or second question where it asked you if you wanted to then accept the like the machine's conversion rate. Um, it was oh. going to like convert it for you somehow but like just reject oh i never saw that we finally saw it in portugal in one spot and some friends of ours had told us about this and the, but they always said you know just reject the conversion rate and and on the screen it looks like you're canceling the transaction but you're not you're just saying no to the on machine conversion rate but just just know that if it, if you ever travel to Europe and, and you get confused on a handheld credit card machine and it asks you to accept the machine's conversion rate, it is okay to reject it. It will not cancel your transaction and your bank will just convert um, as it normally does without charging you a fee for that. So a little travel tip there. Um, actually, another quick random one. I know we're uh, coming up on time, but I don't know what your experience was like leaving Portugal, but having entered the EU through Germany. I didn't go through the passport control line for U.S. passports because I had entered the EU in one country and was leaving through another. So my, I guess my tip here is just like if, you, if you're doing that, if you are entering the EU in through one country and leaving through another, there will be a line for U.S. passports. But there's also this other line for all other passports. And that was actually the line I was meant to go through. Like I was told to go through that line. So just ask. If, if, if that's your scenario, just ask which line you should go through. Save time. Don't, don't get in the wrong line and then get all the way to the end and then be told you should have gone in the other line and then waste time. And then maybe you miss a flight or something. But that's, that's my trip, 
my tip. I wouldn't. I wonder if that was occurring with people that were in uh, the Azores with me. The Azores airport is quite small, um, and so there was not uh, as clearly a defined lanes, or at least I didn't remember that being the case because that was where I was leaving the EU technically. And but I did overhear some people saying that they got into the wrong line and they got essentially stuck for a while. And I don't really know why that was for them, but that's I think that's a fair tip. I mean, one that I always tell people is mobile entry as we're not mobile entry, excuse me. Um, global entry. Well, there's global entry. I love that. But love global entry for the win. CBP process. So your mobile passport control program. So when you enter into the United States, there's an app that you can indicate which port of entry you are returning to, and you can take your photo with your camera on your phone and that completes your entry so you don't have to fill out anything and you get an express lane when you enter into the United States so you just go right to your your passport control officer and then they just you show them your QR code and they scan it and that's all the information they say hey welcome back see you later so before you so, arrive in the states while you have connectivity you you do this and then once you, you do it when you land, uh, yeah, because okay. you need to know what gate you're arriving in. And they oh. only give you, I think, a three hour window of how long it like it expires if you do it too early. Um, so every time I touch down coming back from abroad, I open up the app. I figure out what gate I'm at and I take the headshot of just like what it would what they would take the photo of you when you go through passport control. And then all entry points will have something that is called either mobile passport or express mobile passport control or something like that. Okay. Do you so, do you have um, global entry, by the way? I don't. Okay. So for yeah, you either have that or you have this alternative system. Wow, that's that's pretty great. Cool. Efficient, it seems. Oh yeah. I mean, I've saved like legit hours not waiting in line behind all these other people that are like having to get their their forms filled out and, and read by the the passport control officer. Um, we've talked a lot about our travel experiences positively for the Euros. Um, uh, we kind of, we kind of snubbed a, a little bit of the Copa. I have, I have one <laughs> final lesson learned, I'll call it. I don't know if it's a tip, maybe it's a tip, um, but it's related to Copa and then future forward, uh, future looking, looking into the future, uh, for world cup 2026. But it is, I thought it was super easy to get to MetLife stadium on the train. Like previous to going to that Copa semifinal, I, I kind of thought you had to drive. Like there was no really good way to get there other than driving or taking an Uber. But the train, like as long as you know the route, sure, do some research ahead of time. You have to switch trains a couple times. There's so many train options in that Northeast corridor anyway, but it drops you off right at the stadium. Yeah. yeah. So it, it does fill up at the end of matches, but to get there on the way to matches, it is super convenient um i don't think they do a great job of promoting how easy it is but even like my friends that are locals that live in like east rutherford or west rutherford they're like no i always drive because or i take an uber because like getting there by train is not easy and i just was like that didn't seem to be the case yeah i'm super biased towards trains for all the obvious advantages of big train guy big train guy yeah but anyway yeah that's i don't know it's my tip it's my point of view um we've really enjoyed recapping this whole travel experience this whole summer intercontinental tour if you've enjoyed this episode remind you to rate and review it share an episode or two with a friend who might not be already a listener of the footy travelers podcast follow us on instagram follow us on x follow us on youtube um, and get yourself a supporter scarf in the fan shop yeah there's a there's a link in the show notes to that and i would say if i if i'm asking you as an audience member, as a listener, as a fellow footy traveler. If you can only do one thing, do it always, do it forever. Be loud, be proud, and be good to each other. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F Y. P-E-R media.com Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Mars. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.